welcome to another session of the Public Intellectual Lecture Series of Far Eastern University. I am Leo from the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies, and today's topic is Human Security from the National and International Perspective. The speakers for today's sessions are Dr. Ramel Banlawi, Chairman of the Board of the Philippine Institute for Peace, and, for Peace Violence, and Terrorism Research, and Professor Herman Kraft of the Department of Political Science of the University of the Philippines. Herman Romel, thank you very much for accommodating us for today. Thank you for having us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So perhaps we can begin with something very basic. Um, what exactly is human security? So perhaps you can have a working definition of human security from the national and international or global perspective. And perhaps you, um, both of you can expound on why this is important both on the micro and macro level of Filipino society. Perhaps we can start with you, sure. uh, Herman. Well, um, human security came up as a concept actually uh, uh, that the 1994 UN um, Human Development Report came up with. It was a time when there were a lot of, um, uh, shall we say, uh, internal issues that were actually taking place. Uh, around that time, you're talking about the massacres in Rwanda, the uh, massacres in Srebrenica, for instance, in, uh, in what was going on in uh, Yugoslavia. Um, and, and so the main question there was if we continue looking at things, uh, if we continue looking at security from a national security perspective, meaning to say that the object of security continues to be the state, you know, then the question be what happens when you're talking about the state being the one that's responsible for creating insecurity for its people? Um, and, and so the, um, the, the UN Development Report actually came up with the concept of human security, where it talks about the idea that security should be seen in terms of freedom from fear and freedom from want. Okay? Um, in fact, I think a third concept was brought in later on about the freedom of future generations to, to enjoy the kind of quality of life that we are enjoying right now. Um, but the point here is that it goes beyond the idea of security as being simply about uh, physical security. Right, the survival of the human being. For you're also talking about quality of life here, because um, I think what what the uh, 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 how human security was operationalized in that document, it included I think seven concepts, and that included things like economic security, aside from physical security, environmental security. So all of these things were actually being brought in, which now comes to a to an interesting point because um, it raises questions about. Uh, what kinds of capacities then uh, do governments have to have in order to be able to address the question of human security? In other words, before, if you talked about national security, it was primarily military political, right? So the focus of security was on the capacity of uh, institutions like the military or the police. Now you're talking about things like, for instance, the capacity of the entire government to actually provide the kind of quality of life that would make people feel secure in the kinds of uh, everyday conditions that they have to actually deal with. Uh, so in, in, that, in that context, that's where the norm, the international norm actually came. Um, the interesting thing about the Philippines is that um, since the uh, Aquino administration, the Philippine government has been coming out with a national security policy. Uh, and uh, to a large extent, the basic concepts that you actually have there approximates. It's not exactly the same, but it approximates the international definition of what human security is supposed to be all about, right? So in that sense, it redounds to the security of the human person as opposed to the idea of the security of the state uh, per se, right? Thank you. Um, anything to add? Uh, yeah, uh, that, that's right. Uh, human security is a product of a debate challenging the traditional concept of security, which is state-centric. Uh, during the Cold War, when you talk about security, it is defined as national security, meaning the security of the state against external threat emanating from other states. But after the end of the Cold War, the referent of security uh, now focuses on the security of the people. It becomes uh, people-centric or human-centric security. So when you talk about threats to people's security or human security, what are these threats? So threats are not only emanating from other states or external threats, but happening within the states. And what are these? Poverty. So when you talk about poverty, you talk about food security or economic security. Then you talk about destruction of the environment, so we have environmental security. But at the same time, uh, the breaking down of political institutions. So you talk about political security and in the third world, 
many threats are in fact happening inside and even the state was a threat to human security so for of the political regime so human security talks about the security of human being even against their own government oppressive government so that's the nature of political security but uh, as a result of that security becomes comprehensive and human security reflects the comprehensive scope of security right now so the main difference is that we have the traditional security which is state-centric and the non-traditional security, uh, which is human-centric, and this non-traditional security defines the overall concept of human security. And what are these non-traditional security issues? Then you talk about threats from poverty, environment, transnational organized crime, terrorism, e even from your own government, even from the police, can be viewed as a threat to your own security. So human security embraces a people-oriented, human-centered concept of security as against traditional security, which is military-oriented and state-focused. Thank you very much, uh, for both of you. For because this is a very interesting uh, perspective. Because right now, what we're saying is human security is not about the preservation of the state, but increasing the quality of life of the people of a particular community or nation. If I'm not mistaken. So, given that. Um, perhaps you can provide um, as a brief overview of human of the conditions of human security in the country again from perhaps the no, uh, from the national and international perspective and perhaps present some issues which you think are challenging or affecting our appreciation of human security in the country as citizens as well as our quality of lives now, perhaps you can start this time with well, when you talk about human security threats to the Filipinos, of course, the number one will be the issue of their, their economic status, poverty. So we're raising issues of food security and economic security. So if you want to address human security concerns, then our uh, benchmark for that is the human security index. Are we fulfilling the needs of our own people? based on human security index. And what are these? Ability to have uh, uh, decent livelihood, decent shelter, decent education, and even enough food on their plate. Okay, So those are things that we, uh, we measure. And if you have all these things, then you have some, some sort of securities if you have these things. But if you're lacking of these things, if you lack these things, then you feel insecure. So that's the, that's the measure. And the, the common measure now is the human security, uh, the human development index. And now we are adopting what we call the human security uh, index. So it's being measured with a comprehensive uh, um, issues that will address what we call the needs of the human being, human security needs. So good air, good environment, uh, good food, good shelter, good education those things uh, that uh, fulfill the needs of human beings. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Um, the emphasis, of course, on the human person, right? Human communities. But at the same time, that does not absolve the state of its responsibilities. Uh, because you're still talking about the idea of who's going to be responsible for providing all of this, right? So if you talk about economic security, for instance, which actually includes the idea of um, uh, of what, what Romel was actually talking about in terms of addressing poverty. That's not something that individuals can do on their own. <coughs> so which means the state's still actually involved in that particular uh, context. You talk about political security, that includes things like human rights, for instance. Um, in, in which case, uh, it becomes important to actually talk about state capacity, right? Uh, not as the object of security, per se but the state's capacity to actually provide uh, the, the uh, human person with what would be considered the, um, uh, the capacities to be able to deal with uh, everyday conditions, right? Um, and, and so in that sense, one important aspect of human security, it might be implicit, it's not an explicit thing, but it really talks about or it implies the importance of state capacity to be able to provide all of these things, right? To be able to respond to the needs of the people uh, in whichever capacity you're actually looking at this. So um, it involves capacity at local, you know, regional, national levels. You know? um, and then, of course, uh, to a certain extent, it also talks about being part of an international community and being able to actually address uh, international norms that we, 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 we adhere to, for instance. 
Thank you. Which leads me to my next question because you're uh, actually you're emphasizing economics, yes. poverty, and how it influ or how it has a tremendous impact on the quality of life of ordinary Filipinos. But as we can see, um, even if there are the there seems to be a worsening condition, poverty seems to be worsening on a yearly basis, um, despite high economic growth as reflected in government data. It seems that people um, seem to not be enjoying you know, the fruits of the economic growth. Now that is, a, I think, a discussion we can discuss on a different uh, mm -hmm. topic or a different day. You know? But I was thinking, since most of the issues of hum human security, in uh, most of the issues of human security involve poverty, how does poverty impact, for example, very important, very critical issues um, faced by ordinary Filipinos, like the drug war, for example. No? Um, you have the drug war uh, wherein most of the alleged victims or most of the casualties no, are coming from impoverished communities. No? And then, how does that contribute to you? Is there, and you mentioned something about capacity. No? How does the government programs, or how do government programs address the economic conditions of those who are casualties or who are, who is being targeted by the drug war, and in terms of capacity, is it working? No. Perhaps uh, Herman can start. Well, if you think about it, um, the question, the responsibility, as far as economic issues are actually concerned, um, we talk of our society as fundamentally adhering to a neoliberal economic uh, agenda. So the idea of opening up our markets, um, uh, inviting uh, uh, foreign investments, no? I mean, of course, the consequences this might have in terms of uh, the capability of uh, local Filipino capitalists to, com to, to, to compete with, um, uh, with foreign capital that's coming in. Um, and of course, this brings in questions of, well, how do this uh, affect the everyday lives of people, which basically means you're talking about quality of jobs that are actually available. Um, and I think this is where the issue actually comes up. In, in other words, if you're talking about uh, state capacity, you're not just talking about the capacity of the state to provide, you know, to provide uh, uh, jobs, for instance, right? That's, that's not what we're actually talking about. But you're talking about the capacity of the state to actually provide the environment within which um, Filipinos will actually be able to uh, engage in everyday economic uh, uh, activities. Like, for instance, um, one of the things that's, that's uh, interesting about, about um, uh, the Philippine economy is the extent to which it's been kept afloat by the remittances of Filipino uh, overseas workers, for instance. Now, the question is, why are they going overseas, right? Um, and this is where the idea of uh, whether or not there are jobs that can actually uh, uh, provide them with the kind of um, quality of life, kind of uh, uh, lifestyles that they feel uh, they, 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 they aspire to. Um, and so in, in that context, uh, it becomes a question of what is it that the state should actually be providing? Good education, for instance, right? For them to be able to compete, to be, to be able to actually uh, have a, a, the capacity to contribute to uh, a growing economy. Uh, um, and 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 an not, not just an industrializing economy, you know, but, but an economy that, that, that's going beyond what we talk about as, uh, uh, as an industri uh, industrializing one, right? We talk about uh, the idea of a service economy. Um, and, and so it brings up questions of what is it that the government should actually be focusing on if we're talking about um, empowering our people, right? So you can talk about education, you can talk about jobs, for instance, you can talk about things about, uh, like, like the environment, right? Providing people with a kind of, uh, uh, as Romel mentioned, clean air, for instance, right? Because that goes back to health security, for instance, right? So all of these things are actually interconnected, so to speak, right? Uh, and, and a significant part of that goes back to the capacity of the state to provide the foundations within which people are going to be able to live uh, uh, the kind of quality of life that they aspire to. Definitely. So, it's obvious that the direction um, that human security should go towards is providing social services which are sustainable and can be enjoyed no, by <laughs> the majority in order to, so that poverty will not emerge or we can address poverty. But obviously, um, 
if there's anything we can see in terms of even historical conditions of the Philippines, the lack of access to government, to social services, you know, the lack of access to opportunity, it inevitably leads to conflict. Of course, we're in an urban area. You know, we don't necessarily see it. Of course, in terms of poverty, we see from the urban poor, and in fact, even from the drug war. But in terms of especially the regions, the underdeveloped areas, where conflict, where conflict ensues, no? and you know, the struggle involves not just participation or social participation in rallies or even in governance but actual armed conflict no um, what is the government try um, what are government policies that try to address conflict in these areas especially peace is now becoming a very critical issue for development it's as if we're now seeing development social services especially in underrepresented highly impoverished areas they will not occur without peace no? Romel, perhaps you can give us an idea right yeah there. first uh if you talk about poverty, you can link that with a lot of many issues, uh, drugs, terrorism, rebellion. So, uh, but poverty is not the only driver of many of these problems. But poverty makes people prey to this kind of problem. And that is why our Philippine government has adopted a medium-term development plan that addresses the various aspects of our national problem including security problem. So when it comes to some uh, to security problems, like for example, Muslim rebellion and communist insurgency, uh, we have uh, uh, approaches to, to deal with that. So when it comes to the Muslim rebellion, we, uh, we pursued peace talks with uh, Muslim rebels. So we had a peace talks with the Moro National Liberation Front that was signed in 1996. Then we had this uh, uh, peace, uh, peace agreement with the more Islamic Liberation Front signed in 2014 until we uh, have this Bangsamoro organic law that uh, was signed into law last year and now being implemented with, uh, with the plebiscite last January. Now we have the Bangsamoro autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao replacing the autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao. So that's it. But at the same time, we still have problem in Mindanao. We are still facing uh, what I call two sources of armed conflicts in Mindanao. There's still continuing armed rebellion from the Muslim front emanating from pro-ISIS groups uh, like the Bangsamoro Islamic Freedom Fighter, we have the Abu Sayyaf group, we have the Ansar Khalifa Philippines, and other lawless elements of the Moro uh, Islamic Liberation Front, and even rogue factions of the Moro National Liberation Front. So we have that, but at the same time, we also have this problem with communist insurgency. The epicenter of communist insurgency right now is in Mindanao, particularly uh, in regions 11 and 12, in Agusan uh, provinces, Dabao provinces, Surigao provinces, Compostela Valley. So we have this problem now. Uh, right now, the approach of the Philippine government is to open to the possibility of peace talks with the uh, communist uh, movement, but at the same time, they have this uh, re uh, prerequisites for the resumption of peace talks. But mean meanwhile, while that is not happening, the Philippine government is now implementing what the armed forces of the Philippines would call focus military operations. So that's what the Philippine government is doing now. But at the same time, while doing a military approach, the Philippine government is also implementing non-military uh, approach. Like for example, political solution to the armed conflict in Mindanao, we have the Bangsamoro organic law. But at the same time, they are implementing uh, economic measures to improve that. So we have the Mindanao Development Authority to take care uh, uh, of that uh, issue. So uh, officially, the Philippine government is implementing comprehensive approach. But we still need to see whether the outcome of the approach will really yield fruitful, uh, fruitful benefits to the people in need. So that's the problem. We're only talking about Mindanao, but we also have problem in Luzon and in Visayas. We all communist army agencies all over the Philippines, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. And even the threat of terrorism is also Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao now. Yeah. Perhaps Herb Herman, you can add to that. I was just wondering, why is peace so important? No, because you mentioned no development. There can, no, there can be no development unless there is peace. No? But we're talking about impoverished areas outside of Manila. Yeah. So why should the Manila, the urbanite, no? the care about what is happening in Mindanao, especially, and I'm going to ask later no, about Marawi because yeah. you were talking about 
military and peaceful uh, non-military solutions. But if we're going to use Marawi as a case study, you know, there seems to be something in that. But anyway, let's start with um, why is peace so important even to the person living in a privileged position in, urban er in an urban area? Well, the literature tells us uh, that development and security are practically uh, two faces of the same coin, so to speak, right? That um, in order for us to actually have security, you know, there must be a sense that our lives are actually becoming better, both at the societal level as well as at the individual level. So that means the expectations of people about their, ordin their, their, their everyday uh, uh, conditions um, is connected to security in the sense of how they feel about themselves, right? So which means that um, uh, the, I guess you could, you, you could actually say that the, the motherhood statement there is that development and security are actually interconnected, right? Um, but if you want to go down to brass tacks, for instance, so you mentioned the privileged position of Manilenos, right? Uh, why should we care about what's going on in the provinces? Well, let's put it this way. Um, many times, food scarcity brings up the the, the prices of food, for instance. Where is that coming from? That's, that's actually coming from supplies coming from outside of Metro Manila, right? So in, uh, if you're talking about vegetables, for instance, coming from the Cordilleras, right? Um, when things like uh, typhoons come in and then they get cut off, right? So which means that you're not going to get vegetables actually going to Pangasinan that can be transported to Metro Manila. That means the price of food actually goes up. Right? So it affects us in a very, very direct way if you're thinking of those kinds of things. Um, now, if you think about conflict, right? Um, Mindanao is one of our biggest bread baskets if you're actually talking about the production of food, for instance. Um, the main problem of Mindanao is that it's always seen as, as, as being besieged by uh, conflict, right? Um, there might be uh, governments that might be interested in investing there. You know, in order to actually help economic development there, but they're always stunted by the fact that, well, we don't, we, we're not sure about what, what the security situation is. You know? um, uh, tourists from other countries are always prevented from coming, going to Mindanao. Why? Well, because of the conflict that's going on there. Right? Uh, they always get these kinds of, uh, uh, these kinds of uh, uh, advisories from their respective em embassies. Right? So, in other words, if you want, if you want uh, conditions, economic conditions to actually improve in these areas outside of Metro Manila, the issue of uh, peace and security becomes an important uh, uh, factor. And that, you know, to, us, to, to, to a large extent, is eventually going to, uh, to redound to the conditions that we have in Metro Manila. Right? So it's important for Manilenos to, or people in Metro Manila, to care about what's going on outside. Right? Uh, it's not just finding it difficult to go to go to the beautiful beaches of, of, of Bongao in, uh, in Tawi-Tawi, for instance, right? So it's those kinds of things that we need to actually uh, uh, understand, that, that our security you know, is connected to the security of other people you know, outside of Metro Manila. That's a very good point. So basically, the connection, the, the position there is we have to care because we are related or we are yeah. connected to them. Which brings me back, Rommel, to this, to Marawi, you know, because... <coughs> Um, you mentioned me uh, something about military solutions to addressing armed conflict, especially in um, conflict areas like Mindanao. Um, now, Marawi, for, um, for a lot of people, is a very popular issue you know, because, of course, the, the fears of martial law. So we can see the military solution to what is happening in Marawi. But there are, it's also the other side of the coin, which is reconstruction. No? Because after the, the various military operations in Marawi, the we we can see no there is the armed the the armed solution of the state no but what about reconstruction what about the lives of the people in Marawi because last time I heard I think the the government position was it will leave the reconstruction of Marawi to public to private enterprises and what do you think about that and how does that relate to addressing conflict in Marawi and later on to the greater area of Mindanao. Well, if you really want to uh, improve the situation in Marawi, you really have to rebuild Marawi. But unfortunately, there are some issues regarding how to start the building. Like for example, the concept of normalization. Uh, they, uh, the, the people affected by the Marawi siege, they want the resumption of their normal life. 
Unfortunately, the Philippine government and the people affected by the siege, they have different concept of normalization. For the affected families, particularly in the main battle area now called the most affected areas, their concept of their normalization is to be able to go back to their original place and rebuild their home. But the Philippine government has a different concept of a normalization. It's a new normal, meaning they want to rebuild a new Marawi that is not the same with the old Marawi. A new Marawi will rise up. So now we have that kind of problem. Now the Philippine government presented a, uh, a model of a new Marawi, like uh, several stories of building where you can put all this residency there. No, we want to come back to our original house and then rebuild it even without the help of the government, even the private sector, they will rebuild their, yes, they want to go back, but this is now the problem. Most of them cannot go back. They don't have land titles to their area. They're informal settlers from the perspective of the state. And now, th that is fueling frustration now. So they are telling them, you can go back, but not the old way. There will be a new normal in Marawi. And now that's now the, the, the debate. Now the excuse of the Philippine government now on why there is a delay in the building and reconstruction activities is that there's still a lot of unexploded uh, ordinance and bombs in the area. They're still clearing it, okay? And they are now in the final phase of the clearing. Uh, once that is cleared, then they can start the, the what they call the vertical and horizontal uh, 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 infrastructure development. But the problem is that uh, the people is resisting the, the model being presented by the <coughs> Philippine government because they insist to go back to their original homes and even without the help of the government, they will rebuild their homes. Samia, we don't need, we don't need government help, just allow us to, to go back there and we will rebuild our houses. But, you know, there's a technicalities technicalities about where's your land title, technicalities about how can you rebuild your home, and then technicalities about still not safe to rebuild your home. So the delay in the normalization phase is causing a lot of frustrations now. And this frustration is in fact being taken advantage by threat groups to recruit armed rebels in the area. Now, I went there during the first year of Marawi and the second year of Marawi liberation. And during the first year of Marawi liberation and the second year, I see deterioration of the situation. And I see different three refugee camps there. And the tent city, <coughs> then we have uh, a middle city uh, uh, made of, uh, of Nipahat and uh, cemented refugee camps uh, made of good uh, houses but small but with the, all the amenities like like the Wi-Fi and even uh, 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 TV signals and electricity. But I think the most problematic area there is the tent city where there's no electricity, no motor, no supplies. And I think that's a filter ground for recruitment. And this is the place where you can see the highest level of frustrations highest labor prostrations. Now, when President Duterte said that I will encourage the private sector to rebuild Marawi, it's fueling prostration among those who not, not have uh, capacity to access the private sector. So what will happen to the, the ordinary people? And now, uh, armed groups are taking advantage of that situation to, rec to recruit from their ranks to continue the rebellion. And they're offering uh, monetary uh, rewards for those who will join them in the rebellion in the name of another ideology propagated by the Islamic State. So that's now the situation in Marawi. So the Philippine government right now is saying that in order to prevent this thing to happen, then we have to implement martial law. Uh -huh. And when it comes to martial law, it's a debate you know, in the area, but uh, the, those benefiting from martial law implementation, they like martial law, but those being affected by the, by the military operations, uh, they, don't, they, they dislike martial law. But this is what I observe about the effect of martial law. The implementation of martial law in Mindanao tames the behavior of local politicians and warlords. 
now local politicians uh, are exercising restraint in terms of using violence in the area because the military will say if you don't behave we will take over remember this is martial law we will take over uh, the local government so those local uh, politicians involved in Rido right now or mean, meaning clan war no longer doing the Rido by, by armed violence. Rido is now in the social media. You know, they're quarreling over social media right now. But the use of violence is being tamed by martial law. But we, martial law cannot stay there forever. So that's the effect because um, uh, if you want a normal situation in Mindanao, then eventually the civilians should take over the governance uh, area there. So uh, now, there is now contemplation on whether to extend an martial law again because the situation in the area is still difficult. There's still a threat from, from uh, pro-ISIS elements there. There's still continuing entry of foreign terrorist fighters. Uh, the Bank Samoa Islamic Freedom Fighter is now what we call the new MILF. Mm. They're continuing the armed struggle there. Uh, and the Bank Samoro Islamic Freedom Fighter, particularly the one being led by uh, Commander Toraipe, is now systematically recruiting affected families by the Marawi seeds. So that's it. And another uh, area to be to to be uh, to be uh, watched is the performance of the Bank Samoro government. Right now, there is an MILF-led transition government. They have three years to prepare everything in order to set up a new political system that will really cater to the aspiration of the Bangsamora people. If they don't deliver in three years, that will fuel another frustration. So that's, that's the challenge now of the, of the, uh, of the Bangsamora government right now. If they fail to deliver by 2022, then the local politicians and the local warlords can hijack the agenda of the Bank Samoro government by 2022 because there will be another election in 2022. So who will constitute the Bank Samoro government? If the old faces will uh, form the Bank Samoro government, then we will face more of the same scenario in Mindanao. <coughs> but if the Bank Samoro government will deliver and can make a difference between now and 2022, I think that can spell the difference. But still, the, the situation is very, very uh, fluid. So right now, I consider the main, ch main challenge on the hand of the Bank Samoro government, they need to deliver. Mm -hmm. Because if they fail to deliver, armed rebellion will not stop in Mindanao.